Okay, this is perfect. Now, tell us the story of the Ice Age, Owsley. Explain it to uh, young John here. That's a little difficult to do. I know, but that is that you way. can do it. Perfect light. Wow. I touched okay. on Daddy. Just start from the beginning of it about you were, you were the, telling me about uh, the movement of the, the air around the Earth. That's what really got it to me when you were talking I'm about. I'm ready it. for another. Mm. Well, <laughs> we're living in the midst of a cycle. It's got a real long period to it. It's like thousands of human lifetimes, 115,000 year cycle. So the only traces that we have of this are in our myths. And every group of man on the planet has deluge myths. Has what? Deluge myths. Stories about deluges. Oh, right. Myths. Myths. I yeah. thought you said our myths. No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, and I was kind of pugilistic. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like stories. Hey, okay. To tell about things. Okay, I got all those old stories, but get into the physics. Well, you you know the story, so the way I told you this, the story to you, it's different than maybe I tell it to him. Okay, I won't <laughs> listen. Well, no, no, you should listen, but it just means that I, I don't think I need to start with the physics. I don't want to start with the physics because most people are not physicists. Most people have trouble with it. I know, but you go ahead and bring him up to date. I'll come back when you get to the physics. No, what were you saying about uh, the uh, the cycle that we're in right now? I was talking about the spiritual path, moving oh, back right. towards the spiritual path. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, you know, right. I remember. I remember what you're talking about. You were talking about tales that that tell about the heart, the route of the heart, and uh, what I had been talking about was was something about the physical world. And uh, the basic thing to understand about that is just the fact that we've been we've been on this planet for millions of years. That means that every every one of us has ancestors that have survived this particular phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Every one of us. So that all the stories that are handed down from generation to generation concern the different things that people experience. And until the invention of writing, they were perfect because people memorized them. When they memorize mm -hmm. them, they memorize them perfectly. So when you try to, in my case, it was kind of interesting because I just had a dream. And yeah, the dream just re recurred that. over and over again for maybe three, four weeks. I don't know exactly. And when it stopped, I didn't realize that it stopped for a while. And then one day I realized that it stopped. But I never had any repeating dreams that I can think of. I mean, when you're a kid, you have sort of categorical type of nightmares. Mm -hmm. that are sort of similar. They have the same motif, but they're different. But this was an exact same thing, like watching TV or something, you know, getting a 60-second spot or commercial. It was like I was watching was the planet from outer space. It was like I was on a satellite and I was watching the planet. And the northern part of the planet was all wrapped up in cloud. And I knew the cloud was that the winds were moving really fast at sea level, although you could hardly see it moving. I just knew that. And I knew well, that near the North Pole was a place that was both hot and cold. I knew that. That was the center of it. I, I figured, what and that one? at the what same that? time, buddies, the I knew that it had something to do with the deluge and that well, it was involved with the ice age. Did, that was all. I, I just happens, I never knew that without experiencing any voices telling me or anything else. It was just sort of like you look at an apple. It's a red, you know, it's a red ripe apple. You just know that when you look at it. As if you had seen it before, but I've never had never seen it before. But I knew those things about it. I didn't think too much about it the first time I had the dream. It was after you know taking a little equinox acid trip with some friends and nothing unusual. You know, maybe 300 mics felt good. It wasn't didn't get weird. Nothing got weird. We hung out and waved about different things. And we're looking at the sky being heavy and thinking. Maybe the, the Ice Age is coming out. I've read some stuff in the papers. There's been a lot of stuff in you the papers. You mean the same type of Ice Age that killed the dinosaurs? Well, no, the dinosaurs disappeared about 160 million years ago, or 65 million years ago, I think the last of them disappeared. Wow. Now, this the Ice Age started 2 million years ago, so it's relatively recent. And um, it's, a, it's a sort of a thing that. Um, 
It's happened 18 times or so. Now, this ice age started two million years ago, so relatively recent. And um, it's, a, it's a sort of a thing that um, it's happened 18 times or so. It's hard to tell because each succeeding glaciation wipes out traces of the one before. The only thing that they've got a lot of data on was the last one. The glaciers reached their peak about 18,000 years ago, more or less. And then after that, they rapidly melted away. We've experienced about 11,000 years of relatively warm, constant weather, like we're having now. Constant right. sort of, you know, nice temperature. Yeah, a little LA. weird type of... I mean, it, it's sometimes it's like yesterday I don't, it was really I don't hot. mean like yesterday or today. I mean for the, you know, re recent history for the last 10,000 years, man has lived on a planet that has a temperate climate. The only ice is at the poles, and in the winter it snows, and in the summer it melts away. Mm -hmm. But for most of the last 115,000 years, the northern part of, uh, of the planet is in, 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 as, uh, has experienced these huge glaciers that are up to like 4,000 meters thick, that... weigh, weigh millions of tons. So I mean, that's what's happening right now? No, we're in the midst, we're just at the end it's of a It's melting, winter. right? Glaciers are melting off. Right. The seas are rising. Are rising. Right, exactly. The planet is becoming. Um, well, it's actually. It's not really becoming warmer. That, that's the thing. All these people talk about greenhouse effect, and mm -hmm. yet they're finding that the average temperature of the planet hasn't altered hardly at all. Mm -hmm. It isn't that the planet's getting warmer. It's just that it, something's about to happen. Very close. We're very close. In fact, we're in the process. We're already deep inside the process. Of this thing happened. So, how do you think that relates to your dream? Well, what I dreamed about was this image that I saw. And in addition to that, I, I started having dreams with other stuff, like about ancient Egypt and all kinds of things. And uh, after the second or third occurrence of the dream, I thought, this is pretty unusual. Um, what does this mean? I started trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I figured that if the dream is about something that's real, then it has to occur in the ordinary world. It can't be part of the dream world. It has to be the real world. And in the real world, there's certain laws. Mm -hmm. Like you drop something, it falls. Mm -hmm. And if you put water on a fire, it boils at the same temperature every day. There's like rules, which we call laws of nature, or laws mm -hmm. of physics, which are just the rules by which everything fits together. So I figured nothing in this, well, this world can, can work if it violates any of those laws. So if there's something like this that I'm watching, there must be a real physical principle involved. Perhaps one that hasn't been discovered. You know, you think of an automobile. Mm -hmm. Go back to 100 years. What do you think people would think about that automobile? Yeah, it's it got a spool. See, seem almost so hard, imaginary. Right well, that, that was it? part of the Hopi prophecy, was that they, they foretold the, the white man coming and they saw the cross turned upside down, hmm. uh, used as a spear. Well, and the telegraphs and the and the rails and the airplanes and oh, the phone lines yeah, right. and all that stuff that you know they well, so they were they were kind of waiting for it you know it's it's kind of this whole evolution you know that's taken place the Hopi or the Hopi are people that live closest to the to the meeting with the ways what's called the meaning of the ways when people migrated back into this hemisphere at the, when the glacier started to melt off about 11,000 years ago. You mean coming, coming back in. through the Beringia land yeah. gap? Over there. Straits, yeah. And yeah. Coming. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right at the end of the last glacier period, glacial period, mm -hmm. people migrated across there and migrated down. And when they got to the middle of North America, they split off. Some of them went to the east, some of them mm -hmm. went to the west, and some of them went on down to the farthest tip of Patagonia. Mm -hmm. And the Hopi lived at the crossroads. And they remember this particular thing, and a lot of their um, myths and things talk about this. A lot of their different uh, stories and whatnot they have mm -hmm. are all about this migration. So in that way, they're integ they're they're integrated with the, with this ice age cycle. But the thing I just plugged into something which I think was really happening in 1982, and so I got all this stuff. The story doesn't have is to that do with when the dream. is that when the dream was happening in 1982? Yeah, right. April. You didn't have anything. Stopped to... when uh, that Mexican volcano went off. 
I think the Mexican volcano altered the time cycle on this thing. That perhaps it was going to happen that year, but the volcano throwing all that sulfuric acid in the stratosphere slowed it all down. It didn't, didn't happen that year. And it's sort of like you can get a fire. You start a fire with kindling and paper and all this stuff, and you get the match on it, and within almost no time at all, you got a huge conflagration. But if about halfway up you throw a bucket of water on it, it might smolder for days before it finally catches. Uh -huh. And it would build its intensity much more gradually. I think that that might be what happened. That's why the dreams stop. They've not recurred. But in the finally catches, uh -huh. and it would build its intensity much more gradually. I think that that might be what happened. That's why the dreams stop. They've not recurred. But in the process, I started going to the library. I started reading all kinds of stuff, and I started trying to. And I even called a, a scientist that had given a. a a lecture to before Congress, read a paper before Congress about um, I, uh, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. greenhouse effect, all that sort of ice ages, all that sort of thing. And he said, well, he didn't write the paper. It was a guy in Berkeley. He says, the guy who wrote the paper was an ice, ice age climatologist uh, named George Kukla, mm -hmm. who's a professor at Columbia University. He says, uh -uh. you should talk to him. <laughs> so I did. I called him. He said, well, it happens I'm on my way to California to a weather meeting in La Jolla. He says, uh, why don't you call me down there? So I called him down there and I talked to him for a little while. And he was real tired and fell asleep on the phone. So I thought, Jesus, did my story put him to sleep? Or what? So I thought, well, I better go down there. So I went down there and it was this closed meeting. They said, you can't attend. Right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, it didn't look like they were taking passes. Mm -hmm. So on the last day I went, in. yeah, right. I slipped in the back, sat of... down. And it was this guy from Canada giving a lecture and he was talking about how all of a sudden the atmospheric waves were not declining in intensity, but they were they were actually increasing in intensity, and it was ch causing a shift in the in the uh, pressure patterns, and that was he thought was the reason why the weather all of a sudden in '82 got weird. Now, is that what they were? A lot of people were calling the uh, El Nino, or El, it was a heavy El Nino year. Right. El Nino. Heavy El Nino year. And they're trying and so to that was this on El the, Nino now. And that was bringing the warmer currents and sharks and stuff up Yeah, the all kinds of stuff. That's right. That's right. It was a very intense El Nino year. El Nino turns out to be a byproduct of this process. But anyway, I'm sitting in the back looking at this guy. He's up in the front. He's got a big diagram on a board. He's got highs and lows and so forth. He's talking about stuff I didn't know shit about. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I never studied meteorology. Mm -hmm. You know, I had no idea what he was talking about. But it, it sort of made some kind of sense. And he was saying, well, in this place where there's a ridge, there's normally a low. And I looked, and there was a high, and then there was a low. And the low was right on Bering Straits. There was another low over near Greenland. And I thought, they're somehow connected. The waves from one of those things, where the low is, I'd figured out was a cyclone. This was like maybe a week into this dream. And I was starting to understand some physics about things. And I thought, it sounded like there's an amplification taking place, and it seems the amplification seems to be taking place right where this low is. So maybe the low is is like an amplifier. It's a, and by that time, I'd read a bunch of stuff on meteorology and whatnot, and I discovered that the lows were the act. They, they decided the lows were the active ones. That lows, low pressure centers were were the heat engines. They were where the actual energy was being developed. They were the motors. Mm -hmm. And that the highs were passive. That was like heavy cold air just coming back down to sea level. So here we were with a low underneath this wave, and it seemed to be amplified. The wave was amplified. So I thought, well, why isn't maybe the low, since it's an engine, is adding energy to that wave? So then I thought, gee, that sounds a little bit like electronics, where you have a, an amplifier, or a transistor, or vacuum tube is actually amplifying mm -hmm. the signal where a small change causes a large change in the output. And then I thought, that's funny. It's going around in a circle. It reminded me of, a, of something I'd read about when I was a kid in a Scientific American called the Hilch Tube. I couldn't remember what it was called, but I remembered reading the thing. So, and they thought it was maybe <laughs> Maxwell's Demon. I remembered that, that much about it. That. I thought, it seemed like it was the same going. thing. You put air in, you, you built a little vortex thing by taking a steel piece of steel stock and drilling a hole through it drilling a hole in from an angle so it intersected with the edge of that hole 
then you on one side you put a pipe that was big and on the other side you put a pipe that was small so you had a kind of a Bernoulli principle when you put compressed air into it the air had to spin around in a circle yeah and you put a valve up at the big end where the big tube came out mm -hmm. right? and as you adjusted that the, the other hole the other end was small and if you adjusted the valve you could get super cold air coming out of one end super hot air coming out of the other I mean it would go like from room temperature air it would go like minus 60 or 70 and plus 140 unbelievable temperature differences and so I thought it's that sounded like something I somehow connected that in my head and I thought that has something to do with it that's really important somehow. so you, that might it's, be some kind of undiscovered law or? well it's, the, the, it's not an undiscovered law but it's an undiscovered application the law that's involved is the law of centripetal force when you you know like you when you take a, a, a right. say you take a, a, a string of three or four feet long you put a rock on it, it weighs a pound you spin it around your head you're going around one going about maybe 10 rpm or something like that right and you feel that you put a you put a, a, a scale on there and you look at it and it says oh you're, it's mm -hmm. two pounds of stress right mm -hmm. and so now you increase the speed to 20 rpm and you look at that thing and all of a sudden instead of two pounds of stress it's four pounds right mm -hmm. you, you, so you spin it a little faster every time you double the speed it goes up as the square right every time you uh, and it, that's in order to keep it going on the same orbit right you could but you lengthen the string so if you lengthen the string you can get keep the same force on it mm -hmm. turns out it's a square law that's the same thing that makes transistors amplify the input current change causes a square change in the string so you, if you lengthen the string you can get keep the same force on it Turns out it's a square law. That's the same thing that makes transistors amplify. The input current change causes a square change in the output current. So it amplifies. It goes tiny so you think here, that that's happening there. like at that one? No, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, I do. If you take and spin air around, mm -hmm. you're dealing with something that's not uniform. The air is composed of molecules. Mm -hmm. And each molecule is moving at its own speed. So some are going a little fast, mm -hmm. some are going real slow. They're going in all directions, of course, but when you have wind, when you have air moving in one direction, the most of them are going in that direction. You might say right. that the net result is they're going in that direction. But some of them are going faster than others. So you start to make that air go around in a circle, and it acts like, like a cream separator. The faster ones uh -huh. go to the outside. Go to the outside, and the slower the ones, ones drift the in. But the slower ones are the cold ones. The faster ones are the hot ones. And the cold ones are the ones that drop down because the hot air out. rises. Right. Well, in this case, like, say, in the atmosphere, you're um, a tornado or something, the air goes up. So it goes away from, mm -hmm. the, from the operation of the thing. In the Hilsch tube, you'll let a lot of, some of the air goes out one end. That's the hotter part. And some of it has to be siphoned off from the very middle. That's the cold part. You get the cold part out. Now, the thing of it is, is that this is a statistical thing. So... It has a bell-shaped curve. It goes up mm -hmm. and down. There's a certain number of hot ones. There's a certain number of cold ones. But the majority of them are the average temperature. They're all mm -hmm. moving at sort of an average speed. And so you're making that division in the Hilsch tube as you adjust the valve. You're making a division. Over here, you have a, some super cold air and a warmer air, but not super hot. If you move the thing up to the middle, it, they're about the same. Mm -hmm. If you move it the other way, you get more hot, less cold, so that you're you're limited in the in the heating or cooling effect. They use these things like little point refrigerators, but they're not very efficient mm -hmm. because there's only so much cold air. But when you apply the same principle to a circulation like a tornado, mm -hmm. a hurricane, or some other circulating Where storm. Where there's air and molecules. Lots of air, lots of flow, and uh, it always occurs in warm, moist air anyway. The, the moisture comes out of the air. The heat is taken up. The, the sucker separates heat, makes a flywheel effect by storing that heat. That's why the tornado has a sudden wall inside where the pressure suddenly drops. Mm -hmm. Hurricanes have the same thing, a kind of a wall effect. The wall effect is like the inside edge of this. Oh, it's mass. a void. It's it's kind of a, a an emptiness of like standing well, between, I, I was standing at this point once, Crown Point up on the Columbia Gorge mm -hmm. in uh, 
we were really high on some some acid mm -hmm. and we were sitting there and you could stand and you could feel the way the wind was coming through the gorge and and you could move like this because it was a perfectly round building it was spinning there was and so you could move like this and you could actually feel this empty place in this in this wind the, that where was the, constantly yeah. moving you know and it was that that That'd wall about, right no you, know, you were inside the wall inside the wall in, in that low void pressure, in the low where there was no there no was motion, no rotary motion and it was just it was like we were sitting there following it around we go like this and we go nope here it goes over here yeah, right 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 you, you know in an eddy those are those are not quite developed enough to be called dust devils which is the next level mm -hmm. and then further up than that it becomes a tornado what happens is you got a flywheel all the heat gets caught it's going too fast, so it can't go in, which is just the way out. And yet, it's being forced to stay there by the air that's flowing in towards it. Mm -hmm. So it, it represents a lot of stored energy. It's like the flywheel on a motor, on a car. The flywheel keeps the motor turning. It's ready to go it in either direction. It stores energy. Almost. And in a, in, in, a, in a cyclonic storm, all that air, that's the hottest part, gets trapped in there like a... Like a like a flywheel, keeps it turning, keeps it going. Mm -hmm. The faster it goes, the more efficient it is. And because of the stored energy, the thing exists like an entity. In other words, it's an engine. It's it's now got a working part. It's got a. It's all composed of the working fluid. So it's a machine that has no moving parts other than the working fluid. But it it actually represents a physical, real thing. It's a lot mm -hmm. of hot air that's stuck, like like a spinning donut. It's keeping the thing going, but it. It exists on the, on the surface of the planet, which is curved. So that means that at any given place, one part of it is further from the axis of the Earth than another. So it doesn't move steadily, because as it gets closer to the axis, it has to speed up with re in relationship to the direction the Earth is turning. When it gets to the other end, it slows down. Generally, there's a name for that. It's called Coriolis force. And in, in, the actual, in an actual tornado or something, what it, causes, it does is it causes it to wobble. So when it's wobbling, it's generating sound, generating pressure waves, which are sound. Mm -hmm. So people tell, talk about tornadoes, they say it was really noisy, it sounded like a rushing train, you know, lots of vibration and everything else. I believe that this sound wave that propagates out from a tornado right. is part of the thing that compresses the air going into it, makes it work. Like a jet engine has a compressor stage, that this energy is actually forcing the water out of the air and making it work, giving it heat, giving it speed. So when it goes into the thing, then it crafts it. The faster it goes, the more efficient it is at trapping heat as a flywheel. And all that this energy is actually forcing the water out of the air and making it work, giving it heat, giving it speed. So when it goes into the thing, then it traps it. The faster it goes, the more efficient it is at trapping heat as a flywheel. And also as so does it continue energy. getting speed and does it just get more intense? Well, the tornadoes so are limited because the they're small, they're real small in diameter, so they can only process so much air. Mm -hmm. Also, the tornado is a complicated structure. The downdraft is usually down the middle of the tornado and wrapped around it like a rope, like sections of a rope or the suction vortexes, which are the active ones. So they're spiraling around. The funnel that you see is way outside of these. That's the point at which the water droplets, the, the smallest possible water droplets, are too heavy to go in any further. They just can't go in any further. Mm -hmm. moving we have too much mass, and that mass is part of that equation. So you so see that on the So you don't really see what the active part that's inside a tornado. You can't when you look at one from a distance. You just see the where the water vapor is. But inside of there is this really intense, relatively small uh, cyclonic storm. Very very intense. So it, it it's is limited in that when, no matter how fast it goes, it's got its own yeah, downdraft yeah, feeding yeah. cold air into it, and it can only reach out yeah, just so far from for heat day. from moisture. To get it, and the faster it moves forward, the longer it'll last. Usually, it lasts anywhere a couple of minutes to a few hours. If it's traveling in it with a cold front, like a storm front, and that front is really moving, like 50 or 60 miles an hour, it can often cover a thousand miles even. If it's, it known, seems like if it, if it were more, of, if it were flatter type land, that's where if they it were, occur. if it yeah. were more. Uh, the steeper terrain and stuff that that it would change so fast it, that it seems it like it would to, dissipate yeah. it. Yeah, they have had tornadoes tornadoes right in the middle of the we had one Rockies, in eugene though. not too far yeah. I, it just it happened within a a, a block uh -huh. it came down and just destroyed this house yeah. you know but there was it looked like there was Wasted. a hurricane there yeah you know just like yeah. out of nowhere gone yeah
and then just came and it was on yeah. a real steep hill. And it disappeared. Just disappeared, sure. man. Just wiped these guys out, and they're like going, "Why us?" You know. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's it took like all it just... the heat that was available. And as soon as it ran out of heat, it stopped. It's like a motor when it runs out of gas, it stops. Yeah, just. Now the, this is no problem because normally that's the thing. If the storm's not moving very far, it'll appear, it'll come down, blast something, and be gone. You know, mostly it blasts out in the countryside, and you see a you see a, a torn up place in the middle of a cornfield, and that's it. If it okay. happens in town, then you know about it because it wipes waste out somebody's So these house. Uh, the sound waves that you think are coming off that is it is that relate to the that, it, that the, relates to the functioning how it functions you know it's sort of like the carburetor on an engine or something you know other than that but it doesn't have I, a I'm lost as far as the as as the prophecy of what you think your well, dream meant yeah, and, well, the, and the low pressure. Well, I was just, see, that's the thing about getting into physics, right? Kesey threw me a little bit off track, so I started talking about the physics. The physics is the way in which a, a cyclonic storm works, mm -hmm. which is sort of like talking about how the fuel is vaporized in a carburetor and it goes into the engine and it gets compressed yeah, and the right, spark right, comes right. The, and all that the, shit, right? The which scientific people, you don't need that reason, to drive a you know, car or to understand how a car goes down the road. Right. You don't need to know that. Okay? Right. You don't really need to know how. It's the inner workings. Uh, right. Exactly. You don't really need to know how one of these storms works in order right. to be able to accept what it is that it's that doing. That it's powerful. Yeah. Right. And the there's some of, heat being generated. That's, yeah. That's got. Well, a tornado is one size, right? It's a relatively small one, and you get bigger ones. You get like hurricanes, which are tropical cyclones. They're different in structure than a tornado. They're much more complicated. But basically, they're just a much larger but cyclonic what, storm. What, what I'm trying to say is, uh, what what is what was your prophecy? Well, uh, as far as you gotta let, that, you gotta let me age? talk, and I'll get to it. Okay. Because uh, you're um, you're trying to figure out what I'm talking about, and I'm trying to figure a way to tell you what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. so you'll understand it. Okay. A tornado is a small, small, intense little storm. Right. Okay. And thunderstorms have these kind of structures inside them anyway. They're full of these little cyclones. And a hurricane is a larger one. It can be several hundred miles in, in diameter. And it occurs in the tropics where there's a lot of heat from the water. And the storm that I dreamt about is half the planet big. It's huge. And the core of it, the central part, is in the Arctic Circle near Greenland. And it occurs up there because of heat in the water that's flowing into the Arctic Ocean during the early part of winter. The Arctic Ocean has been exposed to sun 24 hours a day mm -hmm. during the summer, and it heats up. And the ice melts back, and the ocean water warms up. And as it warms up, it expands and moves out into the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. it turns out that these inlets are very shallow and not very big. So there's an appreciable and measurable current that flows. In the wintertime, when the pole turns away from the sun, the same exposed water now radiates heat away and starts to contract and cool. When it does, it draws water in from the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. which, because the inlets are shallow, is warmest water. It's from the top of the ocean, fairly warm water. And inside the uh, inlet called Baffin Bay, there's an area where the ocean currents force this warm water to agitate enough so it doesn't freeze. So there's an unfrozen area, which is very warm. The air might be 40 or 50 below zero, but this water can only be at the freezing point of water. It can't mm -hmm. be any colder than that. So it's a hot spot. So it generates heat, just like the tropical ocean does, and it supports a cyclone over top of it. And this cyclone is dependent upon not only the heat from the water below, but also whatever heat you get from the air that it's processing. <clears throat> but since it's drawing the air Joe? normally locally, Joe? it doesn't get that. It Joe? isn't normally supplied with much heat by that source. But as the as the cycle that we're in progresses, the high glaciers in the mountains are melting off, and this is raising the sea level. As the sea level rises, more and more water can fit through these shallow passages. Mm -hmm. So the amount of heat that's available for these cyclones has been increasing. This has been going on for 10,000 years. We've gotten to a point about maybe 30 years ago that the amount of heat available caused the cyclone's intensity to increase to a point where a process started. Started. We're now pretty deep into it. In 1982, the cyclone in Baffin Bay became strong enough 
to actually um, upset the other two cyclones in the, in the northern polar region and increase their intensity. And they, in turn, started pumping this one. It's sort of like three, three fountains going upwards in the atmosphere. Each one of them is pushing air upwards, making mm -hmm. waves. Mm -hmm. And as the waves go outwards from them, they have to pass over the others. Right. So all of them are affected. They're all affected by each other. Yo! Up to Yo! a certain point, Yo! because the, the law of centripetal force is a square law, as you increase, as you increase the, um, speed? the speed, you increase the force by the square of the speed. You increase the separation of heat by the square of the speed. So a little stretch, which makes the cyclone smaller, causes it to spin a little faster. Right. When it spins a little faster, now it can store more heat. So it grabs some heat. Then when the following wave passes over and it wants to slow it down, it won't slow down because it's got more energy in it. It resembles the kid's top with the plunger on the top. Right. When you push right, down, right. she speeds up. When you pull up, nothing mm -hmm. happens. So each time you push down, you pump a little more speed in. They reach this point in 82. At that point, the cyclones in the Arctic started putting out just enough energy so that each of them was increased a little in intensity and gave a little kick to the wave, increasing the wave in intensity, like the kid on the, on the swing that starts uh -huh. to swing his feet it's, right it's with it. It's pendling him more and more, and it's just... Kicking it out, just to giving it a little more that's right, energy. That's right. Just a little more energy, a little more energy, a little more energy. This has now been going on for eight years. Each year, the, the, during so the So that wave uh, <coughs> frequency is increasing. No. Actually, yes, in a way. Yeah, the energy is going to higher frequencies, which means the wavelengths are getting shorter. So when you look at a weather map, instead of seeing a few large highs and large lows, you see lots of clusters. Mm -hmm. clusters of highs and clusters of lows which indicates the energy is at a higher harmonic as you sh as you increase as you shorten the wavelength by one octave you at the same amplitude you've mm -hmm. gone up 6 db in energy so as energy is added to the atmosphere because it's only so thick mm -hmm. you can't make the waves any bigger than a certain right. size you have to shorten the wavelength. Shorten them up and as the wavelength shortens all of the ocean currents are changed because wind drives the ocean currents this is where el nino comes from and this is also what's pushing the heat from the tropics further towards the poles, which is warming the oceans, which is driving CO2 out and changing the CO2 balance in the atmosphere. And it's causing all this strange rainfall where you don't expect it, drought where you don't expect it, changing all the pressures on the earth because water is very heavy. So you change stresses on the crust, you get earthquakes, you get volcanoes. Because of this, the nature of this of the smaller more intense circulations you get more hurricanes you get more tornadoes you get more thunderstorms and each year that it goes on the amplification goes up too so it amplifies more each year so each year the rate of change is increasing at it's some like a point, pressure cooker yeah right and the 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 critical moment has is has to do with december it's in december turns out that december of every year uh, yeah. Because of the way the Earth is situated the, around the yeah, sun and its axis. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Because of the orbit of the Earth, which is an ellipse, the sun is, is near one end of it. Mm -hmm. So every year you have one day where the Earth and sun are closest together, mm -hmm. called perihelion. Mm -hmm. Right now it's the first day or two of January. That's my birthday, January 2nd. Yeah. Every year, about uh, the 21st of December, by our calendar, the uh, North Pole is pointed directly away from the sun. This is the winter solstice. At that point, you have the maximum amount of cold in the Arctic. It actually lags. It's of about the 1st of January. At that point, you have perihelion, which means well, there's a going... maximum amount of heat coming from the sun because we're closest. So you have the maximum amount of heat at the maximum amount of cold at the same time. This is the trigger for the Ice Age storm that I'm talking about, this ultra uh -huh. cyclone. It's... Uh, it's very interesting because we have this... Uh, Is it because at that point, that's when the most energy can be created? Well, that's the greatest slope. You know, you have the greatest heat, greatest cold, you have the greatest mm -hmm. intensity. It's like rolling a snowball down a hill. The steeper the hill, the more effective the thing will work. Right. Okay. So, every 23,450 uh -huh. cycles, it's, uh, it's very interesting because... 
we have this... Uh, is it because at that point, that's when the most energy can be created? Well, that's the greatest slope. You know, you have the greatest heat, greatest cold, you have the greatest mm -hmm. intensity. It's like rolling a snowball down a hill. The steeper the hill, the more effective the thing will work. Right. Okay. So, every 23,450 years, perihelion and winter solstice come together. When this occurs, you have a condition that can allow one of these storms to happen. Mm -hmm. Before that happens, the energy level in the atmosphere builds. When that energy level gets to a certain point, eventually one of these storms reaches a point where it's producing more power than the physical drag of the air, friction drag against the surface in the atmosphere requires. So it's not limited any longer, and it starts to pull air so powerfully that it reaches as far around the planet as it can, halfway around. And it makes, the, it makes that half of the planet its body. That's its storm, right? Air rushes in at sea level, goes through this thing, extracts the heat. The air comes out the top and goes back down until it gets halfway around. That was the storm. That was what I saw. That was what that image represented. So it's kind of like, I don't know, I may be wrong, but it seems like it, it's something, the same kind of thing that's happening with the thunderclouds, how it's, yeah. the stuff's pushed right up. Yeah. And it, it separates it's charge, separating. it generates the friction of the movement of the air, generates a charge, and the, the cyclone, which works on centripetal force, separates things by their mass as well. It's the velocity squared times the mass divided so the, by the radius. I, is it, the way I see the dream right now is that at that at that one point uh, in December, whenever the slope's the greatest, that uh, that's w that what could trigger this gigantic kind of global storm. That every would year, just, would it would it freeze everything over? It doesn't. Yeah, in a way. It, here's how it works. The atmospheric circulations increase in intensity every year around the 15th or 16th of December the waves in the atmosphere suddenly increased dramatically. Every year, this is back into the 40s mm -hmm. when they started making these measurements, accurate measurements. And so at that time, when enough energy exists and the speed of these cyclones is strong enough, one, this one in Baffin Bay literally just goes off the edge. It just goes until it goes as fast as it can. And it, it's a heat separator. So it traps the heat, which it tries to radiate away. And because it's during the Arctic night, it radiates away into a constant dark background, which can absorb a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. background of outer space is only about the liquefying point of helium. It's really cold. So it's actually removing so much heat from the air, they start to liquefy some of it. And it's this liquid air coming out of the top, falling to the ground, is what actually causes the glaciers to form. And the Russians, back around the turn of the century, dug up a bunch of mammoths in Siberia. And these mammoths had been frozen so quickly that none of their intestinal contents fermented. They still found the things wow. that they'd swallowed so they'd intact just in their stomach. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because it was no just like it was composting. like a, it was like being hit with uh, uh, well they something didn't know so how to some it. kind of gas. It was so cold. So that, cold. They just it instantly just instantly boom. So quickly that none of the bacteria in their gut had a chance to ferment them. You know, when you see a dead animal on the road, mm -hmm. it's blown yeah. up like a balloon. Things ferment, and an, an elephant-sized animal, a mammoth-sized animal, you would could take literally, a long you time. could literally put it in a deep freeze. Yeah, and, and it, it would, would take blow a up. long time Months. because just to get through all that, and it was so cold that it. Worse than that, it's it like just, a compost heap. It's generating heat. The bacteria fermenting the contents. X-ray ice generates heat. You know how hot a compost heap gets. Oh yeah. You dig into it, it's smoking, right? Okay. So the inside of an elephant which eats grass would be composting when the elephant right. died. Okay, this uh, and would be generating heat which would flow outwards towards its skin faster than you could take it away from the skin because the elephant's large and has a small surface and a lot of interior. Right. So what they were saying was that at the time they dug it up, no one no one knew any method you could freeze an animal that quickly. It wasn't until we started liquefying air that they right. discovered that a mist of liquid air would do it. Like they use uh, foggers on, on air, airplanes that are on fire uh -huh. because a tiny droplets can make it through the heat and actually hit the metal and cool it. Before they... Whereas a solid stream would just hit a, it would make a gas and it would not hit it. You know how you pour water on a hot 
plate on a hot stove, like a wood stove. Yeah, and there's and you can't touch it. Right, right. The steam there's a keeps wall it away. That builds up. You have to, and, but if you take a spray of fine mist, it'll cool the metal right down because because of the the breaks the in there. The bubbles can go through the gas, through the steam. The same thing happens with air. Liquid air, in little droplets, a mist of it could actually freeze the animal, but no other method would freeze the animal. And the animals existed, so it proves that liquid air came to the ground sometime. And that was and the that thing was that led some... me to understand that. Yo. See, because I knew the mammoths had been frozen. So therefore I thought, this storm liquefies air, of course. And the animals existed, so it proves that liquid air came to the ground sometime. And that was and the that thing was that led some... me to understand that. Yo. See, because I knew the mammoths had been frozen. So therefore I thought, this storm liquefies air, of course. And if it liquefies air and that comes to the ground, that's going to cool the ground so much it's going to cause a lot of ice making, like a block of dry ice just makes all kinds of snow all around it, right? As it uh -huh. tries to warm up. Okay. So we got this thing making liquid air. Something else is even if the temperature of this hot ring of, of trapped heated air, even if that was like 100,000 degrees, it couldn't radiate heat. In, in six weeks, which seems to be the length of this storm, it couldn't radiate that much heat away that 100,000 years of glaciers were needed to replace it. So I had a problem. How did, how did the heat how did the heat leave? Well, when I'm having this dream, I'm reading everything I can get. So I start mm -hmm. reading all kinds of deluge myths, you know, the stories that people have about deluges. Mm -hmm. Because obviously this storm is a huge rainstorm. All that cold, dry air going south and all that warm, wet air, huge waves, pouring rain out of the skies, all the Earth's surface look like it's covered with water. That's a deluge, like the story of Noah in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I started reading all the deluge myths. And some tropical people have a deluge myth that says lightning strikes the moon during the deluge. So I thought, yeah, why not? So that's where the... Thunderstorms the, generate electricity. The, the actually, we would create so much energy that it would actually okay. shoot it off like lightning to the moon. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you how it, it would works. would like arc out. I'll tell you how it works. Yes, I'll tell you how it works. It shorts out to the moon. This thing is like a giant thunderstorm because positively charged like uh, ions in the air are lighter than negatively charged ions mm -hmm. because the negative ones have gained an electron, they're more massive. The thing sorts electrons, it sorts ions like it sorts heat. The, the, the lightest ones, which are positive, tend to go to the middle. So a thunderstorm generates lightning because it's pumping positive electricity to the top of the cloud. Mm -hmm. And the bottom becomes negative. And then you get the lightning strike. The lightning is, is equalizing the charges. Right. Okay, this thing is a huge storm. And it's, it's doing the same thing. All this intense friction of 1,000, 10,000 mile an hour winds saves so much friction, generates a huge amount of charge, and it pumps mostly the positive stuff to the top. So the northern pole area of the planet is covered with a huge cloud of positively charged right. air ions. Okay. The sun throws out what's called a solar wind, which is ions, mostly positive ions, and they're moving at great velocities. It's pretty tenuous, but scientists have proposed building spaceships with huge right. thin sails. sails. Right, right. So it's, it's definitely a physical fact. Right. And in fact, the, the channel that lightning goes down is a lot like that. It's about the same density of plasma, which mm -hmm. is conducting the lightning. So it's highly conductive. So what happens is, the Earth's magnetic field focuses this solar wind and makes it even more concentrated. And it, it drifts Yo. outwards away from the sun in something that's called a magnetic tail. Mm -hmm. The moon goes around the Earth, and every month it passes through that magnetic tail when it goes full, full moon. Full, the moon has to go full at least once, maybe twice during a six-week period. Right. When it does, it passes through the magnetic tail. This huge cloud of positively charged air ions goes down this channel of uh, solar wind until it impacts the surface of the moon. It melts areas. We call them the maria, the dark areas on the moon. So do you think that, that's, that there's that's already those goes. ones there? Yeah, it happens every time, every 100,000 years. So there's The moon gets a changed face every 100,000 years. And the heat that... Just it, gets a big arc weld up there. Yeah, like a blowtorch. And I figured that out. I went to trace it. I said, okay, if that's true, Okay, that's true. All that air going down to the moon, the next thing would happen would be that would be attracted back to the Earth because the lightning goes down and up and down and up and down and up 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. There's radio frequency oscillation. That means that if the energy goes to the so moon, it has to come back. 
but that's physical stuff. So when it blasted into the moon, it must have thrown a lot of rocks up into the air, up into mm -hmm. the space around the moon, right, which mm -hmm. doesn't have much gravity. When it came back, it must have drawn some of those with it. And they, they have discovered that what they call tektite, is, which is a kind of meteorite. The tektite has the same structure as moon rock. Identical. Right. So that's a big mystery. Why are they the same? Okay. Uh -huh. So then you look and you find out where tektites are found. They're found in, in little compact areas yes. they call strewn fields. Tektite strewn fields. Uh -huh. And then I, so I looked at all the ages of all the, the tektites, all the strewn fields of tektite. And they were they matched up. And then I looked how old they were. And then I looked at continental drift and calculated where they were when they went back in the atmosphere and they were all at the equator. That's where the storm when they went back in the atmosphere and they were all at the equator. That's where the storm Where's turns downwards, and so that would be the that would be negatively charged area. So when they hit when the stream heads back, it can't go back where it came from because that's positive because of the storm. It right. goes for the negative, right? Because it's positively exactly. charged air ice. So it carries all this shit with it when it comes into the atmosphere. They melt, and when they when they find, pick them up, they know what, the last time they melted. That's the age of the field. The tectite's composition is the same as moon rocks. It's the same stuff, so it corroborates the story. So then I called up the guy who measured all the magnetic remnants on the moon rocks. He's at Penn State University. His name is Frank DeShill, and I asked him if he thought that I described this idea. I asked him if the remnants that he found, the magnetic remnants in the moon rocks, could be accounted for by this phenomenon. He said yes, and he said the amount of energy involved would have been about 10 to the 30 ergs. This is a huge amount of energy. It's like the rotational momentum of the, of the Earth itself. And something like that could represent 100,000 years of glacier building. So all the heat that melts the moon has to be heat that's come from the Earth because the equations always balance. What you take from one place, you put an, another place. Right. The equation always balances. That's one of the laws of nature, right. one of the rules. Yo, come here. So that's where the heat goes. On, and we get glaciers from Yo. it. And people survive, but they only survive in certain places. And one of those places is Australia. And another one's Indonesia. And another one is equatorial Africa. Well, a lot of those places are not a place where a white English-speaking guy is likely to be comfortable in, in times of intense stress. <laughs> but Australia. Yeah. <laughs> now they, you see why I go to Australia. Yeah, I've never been there, but they got swan beer there. Swan's good, but I think Forex is better. That's a Queensland beer. A little sweeter. Well, you know, I'm a little biased. If they yeah. had bear beer, you'd probably like it. Bear. <laughs> no, I like, the, I like a lot of Australian beers. A lot of good ones. A lot of good ones. Well, but see, it's a pretty intense trip. It's a pretty sure intense is. trip. I think I, you know, I don't really follow it all. But well, the, the ice builds up. It takes so long to replace that heat that the ice continues to build for 100,000 years. So every 23,400, when the perihelion winter solstice thing happened, during four of those, there's ice all over that area, mm -hmm. so there's no no water up there, so it can't happen. Mm -hmm. So it's like a gun; you can pull the trigger all you want, but until you cock it, it doesn't do any good. Right. So when eventually all that heat gets replaced, and then the ice melts off, and it takes maybe three, four thousand years to melt off. Which then is what's happening right now. It has happened eleven thousand years happened. ago. Right. Eighteen thousand years ago, the glaciers were so maximum. We're just set up eleven thousand years ago, it was all gone. After seven thousand years of glacier melt back, it was all gone. Okay. For 10,000, 11,000 years, we've had this kind of climate. Mm -hmm. Now we're at the end. Now this, the storm event occurs, the result of which the climate changes and we go into glacier building. And glacier build, the glaciers build, the water table drops, and the, gun, the, the, the trigger, even though it comes around, doesn't do anything. Then it all melts off. Conditions like today occur again. And then the next time the perihelion and winter solstice come together, bang, it happens. You get a tremendous destructive storm, deluge, new glaciers. So this cycle's gone on 18 idea times. When that's going to happen? Soon. Sometime this year, next this year. This year, you think? Sometime within the next few years. Yeah, it could you be really this year. You really think it's that close? I do indeed. It could be. I can't so tell you. Live it I up cannot right now. <laughs> tell you. There is no way of you knowing understand until that we Christmas. better live it up now, all right? <laughs> now, this could be the last Christmas. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It could be the an point ice is, Christmas. The point is, is that it's like a railroad track that is long unused, right? right. If you pitch your tent on the railroad track, when the train comes through, you're finished. Mm -hmm. But if you're over there, you watch the train go. Okay, everything doesn't go. People are still here. 
Our ancestors were well, here. So how, how, Every now, how do you live in uh, Australia? Do you have a, are you a Up citizen or no. you have the visas point. or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, you can go down there on a tourist visa. You can stay up to six months out of the year down there. So you you, need if to you'd want to go down there. Time. You only need to be there you know, you in wanna, December. You want to go there when it's winter here anyway. That's right. It's warm yeah. there. So it's a beautiful just place. It's a lot of fun. So the advice is uh, to vacation in Australia if you right. want to survive in the, During the year winter, 2000. Christmas hey, they got that, they've got that show down there called right. Beyond 2000. Yeah, that's right. They did. You know, yeah. So yeah. they're yeah. really ahead yeah. right down there in Australia. Well, it's just a lucky place. They call it the lucky country. It's a lucky place. Thank you. It is. It's the right place, but it's not the only place. I had people a dream survive about... on Java. They survive on Bali. They survive on Java. They survive on Bali. They survive on New Guinea. They survive in southern uh, parts of, of Indonesia. They survive in Africa, actual Africa. Mm -hmm. Several million We've people new... probably but will the survive best this event, for, for but the lots white of them won't. Yeah, yeah. Is I think so. Because they've got a lot of beer there, they drink more beer per capita. But... <laughs> it's all right with me, you know. There's a lot of good reasons for heading to Australia. Yeah, yeah. it is. Does if anybody you... know what December 16th, 2012 means with it with the Mayan calendar well, ending? December 6th, the 16th is the day, the 15th, somewhere between the 14th and the 16th is the day every year when the atmospheric wave motion increases dramatically. Mm -hmm. And when I went back and tried to decipher uh, the Old Testament toil of Noah, I started, uh, I thought, first I thought about it and I realized that the book was supposed to be written by Moses. And Moses is the guy that led him out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Before that, they'd lived for 500 years in Egypt. Mm -hmm. That meant that any calendar in the Old Testament in, in, the, in the first five books has to be an Egyptian calendar. Yeah, but people so, also lived in the Bible for hundreds of years. Yeah, but let's too. not talk about that. I'm talking about the fact that when they I tell the story it. of Noah, they said, okay, the rain began on the 17th day of the second month. Now, there's a specific reason for uh -huh. saying that. Seventeenth so day of out what month? Of the second month. Seventeenth day of the second month. Okay, but this has got to be the seventeenth day of the second Egyptian month. So you have to know what kind of a calendar they had about 1,300 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of research on that. And I read in a book by a guy named Davidson where he postulated that their year actually began with the first day of winter which was defined as halfway between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. In other words, the solstice is the midpoint of winter. Right? Which is the 22nd? Yeah, 21st of December. Just like two days ago we had midsummers, right. Right? which is the middle of summer, summer beginning around the 1st of May. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Egyptians did this because they planted by the by the flood of the Nile. Right. And so they had to know exactly. And it they didn't have a mechanical calendar like, like we have. Mm -hmm. What they did was they observed the sun every year and the day nearest to the solstice was 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 the measured start from of that. Yeah. So some years they put five days extra, some days they put six days extra. Other than that they had twelve thirty day months. So and, that and each month was named for a particular god of the Egyptian pantheon. And each and in each month they had a festival day on the seventeenth day, which was the festival of the god for which the next month was named. Okay. So the seventeenth day of the second Egyptian month was a specific day, was also a festival day. Mm -hmm. And the, the third month was named after Hathor. So the seventeenth of the second month was a festival of Hathor. Hathor is the goddess in the Egyptian pantheon that brings a flood that destroys mankind. Mm. It's pretty interesting. Gets more interesting. The seventeenth day of November, or seventeenth day of the second Egyptian month, calculates out to the fifteenth, sixteenth of December on our calendar. No. Works out. I'm, yeah, it's I, the I only thing that doesn't work that. out, though, is that people aren't educated enough to to well, even the, the start thinking really on smart. those kind of levels. You that's know. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, that's they want the to thing. watch Cosby. Sure. But how about the people who were driving on the freeway when it collapsed, you know? The, not knowing the freeway is going to collapse or not listening to anybody or maybe somebody told them wouldn't make any difference to them. It's not real till it happens. Mm -hmm. When this storm happens, it's very real for about 95 to 98% of don't, humanity. Don't believe it. They're going to flatten out, flatten out. That, whether they believe it or not, it's going to happen. That's the thing. Just like you and I, right? We were born and one day we will die. Believe it or not, one day we will die. It's 
part of the trip. It's, mm -hmm. it's punched into the ticket. And that happens. And lots of things happen. This particular phenomenon that I figured out is going to happen. I think it is. I don't see anything that turns me away from it. All the changes I see fit right into the predictions. A lot of, lot of um, leading evidence. Yeah, there's lots of it. Every year it gets more. And, the, and every the time you that, under, uncover something, it just kind of locks it in even more. And this, the, uh, the dream didn't tell me when. It didn't tell me anything. I figured out what time of year it has to happen. I have no idea what year. Each year I expect it could be that year. So if I say it could be this year, that's because each year I expect it could be that year. Until it happens, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to get very, 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 very weird, the weather, as we work up to it. As we get closer, mm -hmm. it's going to get and very it is. weird. I, I mean, it's it already, like I... But how weird is very weird, right? <laughs> you know, more weird than today, but it might not be. We might be experiencing that last year. Or it, if it doesn't happen this year, then next year we can say, well, hey, it could be this year. The idea is to try to be more prepared each year, be more prepared. I try to encourage people to take vacations because Australia, go down in like late November, right? Only on the year that it's happening, the weather may start to get so weird you want to go earlier, maybe September, October. So when Christmas comes around, it hasn't happened, okay, now you can go home because everything's fine. So you don't have to give up your job, you don't have to give you a place. All you have to do is just arrange your vacation. So you take your vacation during that slot, the month of December. Have you talked to the Australian Tourist Board about no, this? No, are you kidding? You don't talk to anybody <laughs> about kidding. this. You I'm talk to kidding. people about this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Most people won't believe it. A few will. Yeah. Some people go down there. It's such a neat place to go anyway. What difference does it make? What excuse? What reason? I don't oh, care really why people go down. there. I would like to see some of my friends go there. I'd like to see thinking people go there. I'd like to see people with knowledge. As educators, I'd like to see people who uh, think about social structures and so forth. You know, when all this comes, the, the people that are left over are going to sit down and say, hey, what kind of government are we going to have? Mm -hmm. What kind of rules are we going to live by? So if people are thinking about it, we try not to make the mistakes we made before. I mean, it's an opportunity if it occurs. Yeah, it's kind of like saying, cleaning the slate. I could be wrong. It could be just some crazy dream. It's put me on a hell of a trip, I'll tell you. Well, you know, I always had the dream where I woke up and everybody was gone and everything was left. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I was the only one walking around. Yeah. That was a strange dream. It, it might not happen. It might just be some trip that I'm on. But I'll tell you, it's a mo one of the most intense trips I've ever had. It's lasted real well for eight, eight well, I years. I can say that it, it certainly I caused you to control. do a lot of research. Yeah. Research, I'm getting bit. Me too. <laughs> Cold and dim.